Mr. L. Bharat. So, without much ado, I request our Chairman of Bangalore Branch to is escort and uh, invite our speakers C.A. Partha Sharadi and Mr. Bharat on to the dais. And also request our chairman to offer a welcome bouquet and momento to our speakers uh, for accepting our invite and sparing their valuable time in spite of their busy schedule. Uh, before commencing this session, it's my privilege to introduce our speakers. Uh, our speaker, Partha Sharvi Sudarshanam, is a partner in Singhvi Dev and Unni Chattered Accountants. He handles the statutory audit division of the firm and specializes in corporate laws. He's also involved in the audits of uh, NGOs handled by the firm and the FEMA practice of the firm. Partha is also known as a fellow member of the Institute and Qualified as a CA in 1996 and graduated in commerce from Delhi University. After a brief stint with a well-known finance company post, his qualification, post qualification, Partha joined SGU and became a partner in 2000. And he is also qualified information system auditor, having been awarded the diploma by our institute. And uh, he is on the board of BGSF. Yes, he Financials Limited as a public representative director. He also served his term as a chairman of audit committee in the company. Yes, so we have yet another speaker among us. He is uh, Mr. Bharat L, the Associated Company Secretary. Uh, Bharat has uh, over nine years of experience in the field of taxation and foreign exchange matters. He focuses on advising clients on Indian and cross-border tax and regulatory issues, tax, uh, tax optimization strategies and transfer pricing. He regularly attends to matters involving representation before the tax authorities and income tax appellate tribunal. With this uh, brief introduction, we once again welcome you, sir. Now I hand over the session to our speaker, Sri C.A. Partha Sharati. Over to you, sir. Uh, uh, one request, one car, car number K03MV9. Uh, good evening, Chairman. Good evening, uh, Geeta Madam. And uh, good evening to all the delegates present here, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the Bangalore branch for having invited us to this discussion, a practice alert discussion on. FEMA and I really appreciate these uh, practice alert sessions which is as uh, <clears throat> the chairman um, told me just a little while ago an effort a symbiotic effort in ensuring that a junior a supposedly a junior and a senior both come together and this gives an opportunity for the juniors to come forward and get trained in public speaking and sharing their views, knowledge and experience. In that sense, <clears throat> I think I should be the one who should be doing the talking and uh, my colleague on my on the dais, Bharat, is quite a seasoned and experienced uh, uh, colleague of mine by himself and uh, he should be the one who should have done the guiding. So nevertheless, in terms of my white beard, I happen to be the senior today and I would uh, <coughs> request my colleague Bharat to be the anchor for this uh, session and this talk today. Before that, just the opening remarks. FEMA has been always uh, a semi kind of a, a law. 
because if you look at the act the act is very small largely everything is uh, uh, driven by the regulations that come out the rules that come out the amendments that are made to these rules and regulations which are not so legalist so to say they are quite often very loosely worded capable of being interpreted in many ways and that's where all the problem crops why we did move from a fera regime to a fema regime where you know we had dispelled the fear of huge penalties falling on our heads and things like that still the penal provisions are quite stringent and it can go up to three times the value of the transaction amount involved so it's a little uh, tricky in terms of how you interpret things as far as these regulations are concerned basically as i told you because they are so loosely worded and capable of being interpreted in more than myriad ways and with the changing environment around us far more changes have been brought up and with the stress of our prime minister on the make in india skill in india schemes things did require a change we did need the foreign direct investments we need foreign money so definitely a lot of things fell in place in according in accordance with his vision and what the government wants to achieve having said that the reforms that one would have liked to come in this area with ease in doing business in india a lot more changes were anticipated a lot more liberalization a lot more reforms and to do it away completely with a lot of unnecessary procedural or paperwork we are yet to see those changes i am sure those are on the way with the hope yes those changes will come the law will get far more simplified will be more in tune with the international practices and with the hope that we will all be there together in the development of the economy and be become the leader in the global scenario so we look forward to that kind of a situation sooner than later with these words ladies and gentlemen i now request my colleague l bharat to take us through the recent amendments that have come across in this law and legislation and what does it mean to us and how do we cope up with these situations thank you thank you sir thank you uh, icai uh, thank you uh, chairman sir uh, thank you audience and uh, welcome uh, 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 to this evening uh, i'm sure uh, uh, many of you would have attended the real estate uh, seminar a short while back and uh, uh, many would be uh, uh, here after uh, uh, many here would be uh, here after uh, listening to uh, a lot of interesting things from an income tax stamp duty standpoint uh, as uh, partha sir said uh, fema is a, a semi legal uh, law uh, so semi legal law that itself is uh, says that itself says a lot uh, uh, the uh, uh, what that implies uh, is that uh, uh, as we uh, as we move through the slides uh, i will uh, elaborate on that uh, there is a policy mandate uh, uh, which uh, drives uh, foreign investment and there's a legal mandate uh, which uh, drives foreign investment the policy mandate is directed by the government of india the ministry of finance and the operational legal mandate is largely driven by the reserve bank of india uh, so uh, uh, with with fema uh, uh, it's not as straight forward as the income tax act we open the act uh, we uh, read through the provisions we interpret them we advise clients Uh, with uh, fema what happens is we we have to look at the policy and the policy is not something written in stone uh, 
uh, uh, the policy uh, explains the intent of the government and uh, uh, there, there could be uh, 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 a little bit of loose language in that. Uh, that is on one side, on the policy side. Again, uh, coming to the legal side, we have the FEMA and the rules and regulations which are uh, 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 drafted and which come out basically from the Reserve Bank of India. That is pure law. So there, uh, what happens is we have to go through those regulations and read them and interpret them just like we do with the Income Tax Act. But again, that has a lot of interplay with the policy itself. So uh, uh, we, we read a lot about strict interpretation, literal interpretation, etc. in FEMA and, uh, sorry, in income tax and other laws. But with FEMA, we need to do that interpretation with a pinch of salt. We need to do that interpretation keeping the policy uh, in mind. And uh, that is where uh, uh, this evening uh, we'll uh, take you through two uh, major amendments which have happened in the FDI policy, keeping in line uh, with the uh, policy of the government of India to uh, welcome more investment into India uh, to promote the Make in India, uh, Skill India initiatives. So as uh, Patha sir had uh, just mentioned, uh, to invite investment uh, uh, into India, the, the, the uh, government of India has taken a lot of initiatives. We've been seeing uh, our Prime Minister visiting countries uh, frequently, visiting the Silicon Valley, inviting them to come down to India, inviting uh, them to make in India. And uh, those uh, visits have been translated into policy decisions and uh, the, the uh, amendments which came to the FDI policy in uh, November are a clear indicator of the government's intention to welcome more uh, foreign investment in India. Uh, with that, we'll just uh, move through the slides. Uh, this will broadly be the uh, agenda for the evening. Uh, uh, the background which uh, uh, Patha sir introduced and uh, which I uh, just briefly took you through. After that, uh, uh, I'll just outline a few uh, points which we'll, uh, amendments which we'll discuss and we'll go through the FDI policy uh, amendments which came up in uh, November. After that, we'll go through the external commercial borrowing uh, uh, policy and law amendments which were introduced by the, uh, which were uh, brought in by the RBI again in November in line with the policy, uh, FDI policy direction and then after that a few uh, amendments which uh, have taken place in the recent months, uh, we we'll just uh, run past that. Uh, so as uh, Partha sir had uh, mentioned, uh, there has been, the, the, the current uh, government has extensively promoted the Make in India uh, uh, idea and uh, uh, it's been uh, uh, doing a lot to bolster the investment climate and uh, enhance the ease of doing business in India. Uh, there have been developments across uh, the uh, spectrum of law and regulations. Uh, we have uh, uh, the New Companies Act of 2013 and uh, uh, a lot of uh, sections in the Companies Act have been notified and rules and regulations have been uh, introduced uh, with, the, with, with the intention of uh, promoting uh, better corporate governance, etc. Then uh, we have uh, the income tax uh, uh, amendments also which have come in uh, uh, the, the 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 idea behind the income tax amendments has been primarily to do away with retrospective amendments and uh, going uh, 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 a wee bit slow on aggressive taxation but at the same time uh, focusing uh, a lot of attention towards black money and getting black money back uh, into india and then uh, there has been intense efforts to usher in the goods and service tax uh, uh, amendments and the legislation, but uh, uh, politics has uh, uh, has been doing a lot to hold it back. And finally, we have uh, these amendments which have come up in uh, FDI, uh, FD, FDI policy and uh, the FEMA law. Uh, and uh, all the amendments which, which we are going to uh, run through this evening are primarily uh, a, a policy calibration towards capital account management in response to macroeconomic dynamics. This was exactly the language of uh, the RBI governor Raghuram Rajan when uh, he was uh, uh, explaining the rationale for the ECB policy amendments. Uh, so uh, as uh, Parthasa mentioned, uh, we moved away from a tight uh, uh, era of FERA to uh, more of management in FEMA. 
again there was a lot of control over capital account transactions basically uh, transactions which involve uh, 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 infusion of equity borrowing of loan basically which affect our capital and uh, there has been a uh, there has been a regulation of current account transactions current account transactions are our day to day transactions of purchase of goods purchase of services remittance for consultancy fees payments for royalty brand names etc uh, while the policy on current account transactions has been uh, pretty predictable and there are no uh, tight controls around uh, uh, capital account transactions, uh, sorry, current account transactions, to, uh, we, uh, on the capital account front, there has been a wee bit of control when the foreign exchange flux, uh, foreign exchange rate, when the INR dollar rate uh, undergoes a bit of fluctuation, we see the RBI uh, doing its bit to make uh, uh, legal, I mean, legal changes to tighten primarily capital account transactions. Uh, so uh, uh, there was also this discussion on uh, whether in India will move into full capital account convertibility. That is to undertake uh, capital account transactions, do you require uh, a regulatory approval? Do you require a lot of regulatory compliances or can you can we do it in the manner we go ahead with current account transactions? So a full cap capital account convertibility would mean that we do not require any approvals. But India is still not uh, an economy mature enough to uh, venture into full capital account convertibility. Uh, therefore, uh, the RBI has appreciated that the capital account convertibility is required, but at its own pace. It will decide at its own terms, at what speed are we going to uh, achieve uh, capital account convertibility. That's where uh, Mr. Raghuram Rajan indicated that these policy changes are towards calibration of the capital account management system of India. Uh, so uh, this evening uh, we'll just uh, run past through the salient uh, amendments in the FDI policy as uh, 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 put out by the uh, DIPP, that is the Department for Industrial Policy and Promotion. That is a govern. That is a body of the government of India. It, it has not got anything to do with the RBI. The DIPP primarily uh, comes out with policy announcements. Policy announcements and. Uh, uh, actually speaking, all these policy announcements are not enforceable in a court of law, although you can take this point on uh, promissory estoppel. Uh, but these are not to be, policy pronouncements by DIPP should not be read as law uh, in the manner that we read, say, the FEMA itself, the rules and regulations under FEMA, and, uh, uh, the, and for example, the Income Tax Act. So, this is again a policy prescription. Uh, next, after, after our discussion on the FDI, FDI liberalization, we will go to the ECB amendments, that is the amendments in the external commercial borrowing policy. Uh, that, that is again, uh, uh, that again has been undertaken primarily through, primarily by the RBI. The RBI is the authority which, which uh, uh, operates FEMA, the Foreign Exchange Management Act. So, uh, in, in the ECB policy, we can look at law because uh, the ECB policy will be enforced by making uh, suitable amendments to the uh, uh, rules, regulations and the FEMA, although even the FDI policy will, will translate into a legal amendment uh, that apart. Uh, so uh, the FDI again is a policy pronouncement whereas the ECB is more of a legal, uh, will, will have a, a will starts off primarily as a legal amendment. Then other policy measures such as uh, permitting the foreign investments in real, in real estate investment plus infrastructure investment plus and alternative investment funds and uh, FDI white label ATMs and the enactment of the FEMA regularization of assets held abroad by a personal investment in India regulations and we we'll just also go through quickly with a few key amendments which have happened in the master circulars which were uh, put out in July 2015. So firstly, we will start off with the uh, FDI liberalization uh, uh, policy. Uh, the, uh, the FDI policy, the press this, the, the FDI liberalization has primarily happened through press note 12 of 2015. So all the amendments to the uh, FDI policy, which consolidated FDI policy, which was brought out in May 2015, uh, the November press note seeks to amend that policy, which was brought out in May 2015. So uh, the uh, May 2015 the policy document is quite a bulky 125 page document. It contains uh, the, the way the, that policy is worded, it, it 
looks as good as any lock. It has a whole set of definitions and intents, objects, and clear do's and don'ts, just like any lock has. Uh, so it also, as I mentioned, it also has definitions. So this, uh, the the recent uh, uh, the press note 12, which has sought to amend the policy, has defined manufacture in manufacture for the purpose of the FDI policy. Uh, this is primarily, again, the amendment is primarily intended to promote the uh, uh, Make in India concept, uh, Make in India idea, which uh, the Prime Minister is proposing. So, uh, what has, uh, by, by defining manufacture, what have they gone on to do? Uh, the government has also mentioned that uh, a manufacturer is permitted to sell goods manufactured in India through wholesale and or retail, including through e-commerce, without government approval. Uh, so primarily uh, what it seeks to do is, uh, if uh, goods are manufactured in India, they can be sold through the wholesale route or the retail route without any government approval. So let's just step back uh, uh, and uh, see why this amendment was required. Uh, there was a little bit of, uh, I mean uh, all of us have heard about uh, the politics or uh, nitty-gritties behind the FDI in wholesale trade. Uh, there has been a lot of political drama and a uh, lot of news when uh, uh, wholesale trade was uh, opened up for uh, foreign investment. There was fear that uh, foreign wholesalers will spam the Indian markets with low priced goods and uh, uh, threaten uh, uh, small and medium uh, shop sellers in India. Similarly, the fear was that, uh, say for example, uh, on the retail front, on the retail front, on the multi brand retail front, uh, leading multinational retailers such as say Walmart, Target, etc. would open huge supermarkets in India and again threaten the uh, small shopkeeper base. So given that, uh, given that vote bank sensitivity so to say uh, and the political sensitivities, uh, uh, FDI wholesale trade and retail trade is quite strictly controlled in India. Uh, in that backdrop, there has been a carve out by the government of India uh, by this policy amendment by stating that as long as the foreign manufacturer undertakes a whole host of manufacturing activities in India, he will not be restricted from selling his goods in India either through the wholesale uh, channel or through the retail channel or even through e-commerce. Uh, on the nitty gritties on e-commerce, I will uh, come back later. Uh, in the relevant uh, portion of the discussion. Uh, but this is uh, what primarily the government intends to achieve after defining manufacture. Basically, they want to lay down that if there is manufacture happening in India, the Make in India concept, then and not lay down any restriction on his distribution function in India. He can distribute his products either through the wholesale channel or the retail channel or through the or through any e-commerce platform. That is what the government has categorically mentioned and this is intended to welcome more uh, foreign uh, manufacturers to market, manufacture their products in India rather than only import and distribute it in India through wholesale or retail channels. It wants to encourage more uh, manufacturing and that is the reason why these, uh, this policy amendment has been brought out. However, uh, 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 on, uh, on, uh, uh, if we just step back and just think through, uh, okay, fine, they have, uh, they have made this amendment. Uh, and uh, let's just apply it to a few business models and see how, how, how this translates. So again, I do not have any answers here and uh, uh, I will uh, uh, I'll just share a few thoughts uh, which uh, we have, uh, Parthas will uh, supplement. Um, and we were just thinking, uh, what about, uh, for example, full-fledged manufacturers, foreign manufacturers have always had a, 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 a free hand in India. Say, for example, Hindustan Unilever. Hindustan Unilever is a uh, an Indian subsidiary of a UK Dutch uh, brand and it has been manufacturing goods, soaps, detergents, a uh, whole host of fast moving consumer goods in India for a long period of time. And uh, so that is a company which manufactures in India and it also sells extensively in India primarily through wholesale channels. It also has a minor retail uh, uh, operation through uh, what they call the e Shakti module, but that is very minuscule, and finally they operate through the uh, wholesale uh, channel. So, I was just wondering uh, would it affect people like Hindustan Unilever? Would it affect people like Nestle? Nestle has also been in India for a long time, it is listed in India for that matter. Uh, 
less play manufacturers Maggie and uh, it has been in the news recently. That is also a foreign company and basically a, a, a French or a Switzerland uh, subsidiary in India. And that has also been uh, engaged extensively in the Indian market. So uh, our view was that uh, uh, it will not affect such players. But uh, uh, who would it invite? Basically, say uh, uh, a branch like say Nike and Adidas, Reebok. If they have manufacturing facilities in India, they can also export the, the goods manufactured in India can be sold in India through the uh, uh, retail channels as well. Right now, uh, the models under which they primarily work are the uh, franchise models or a wholly owned. Uh, they would have a wholly owned. Uh, they would have a wholly owned subsidiary in India which purchases those goods and sells them in the wholesale market. But if they were to manufacture in India, they would also have access to the retail, uh, directly to the retail channels. Um, uh, uh, some other uh, scenarios were, are, are that, for example, manufacturers from traders who import from outside India. So we're just uh, looking at a scenario where, say, uh, HUL manufactures only, say, 30% of its uh, 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 total sales, and the rest of the rest 70% is wholly imported from outside India and sold through the sold in the Indian market. Would this amendment have any impact on that? Would it would such an activity of Hindustan Lever or Nestle fall foul of the FDI policy? So that uh, uh, there is not much clarity on that uh, aspect. Similarly, uh, uh, India is known as a uh, manufacturing hub for textiles. Say, uh, a lot of uh, foreign uh, uh, cloth, uh, clothing companies say such as uh, 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 Nike, then uh, you have all the uh, Louis Vuitton, etc. They source a lot of goods uh, from India uh, and have it labeled also in India. Say, uh, we have all of these clothing manufacturers in uh, Tirupur uh, who primarily do a lot of contract manufacturing for foreign uh, clothing companies. And uh, the degree of manufacturing which they do is, uh, 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 is including labeling. So, what would be a, a scenario where uh, that Tirupur manufacturer, he manufactures it completely. He also attaches the say Nike label on that product. If that foreign company, if Nike permits that Tirupur manufacturer to sell Nike goods in India, would it be permitted? Or would Nike be directly required to operate in India? That is a scenario which we are thinking. Nike need not have a direct presence in India, but it will ask its contract manufacturer itself to distribute the products in India. Would this satisfy the Make in India requirement which uh, is implicitly uh, required under the new mandate? That is uh, uh, something which we were just thinking about. Uh, we didn't have any uh, ready answers, but we, were, we thought it would be worth uh, sharing uh, uh, with you ladies and gentlemen. That was the first uh, uh, amendment. Uh, thereafter, uh, another significant amendment is uh, relates to FDI LLPs. Earlier, uh, any FDI in LLP required the government uh, approval of the government of India. Uh, say, for example, if an LLP was to be engaged in uh, software development, that LLP had to take the approval of the government of India under the previous uh, regime. But now, uh, this uh, the, the policy uh, change in November 1st of 2012 permits uh, uh, FDI in LLP under the automatic route in all sectors where FDI is permitted under the automatic route. Say for example, uh, FDI is permitted under, under the automatic route for a software company. Uh, it is permitted under uh, the automatic route for a marketing support service company. Uh, however, if the same activity had to be carried on by an LLP, it required a government approval earlier. But going forward, such activities will not require the approval of the government of India. Uh, however, uh, in, in, uh, in sectors where there is uh, a government approval requirement or there is a performance uh, criteria uh, in, in any particular sector, say such as the uh, uh, real estate sector. That is when uh, uh, the, uh, 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 an approval of the uh, government of India will still be required. So, in, area, so, to summarize, in areas where uh, uh, investment is permitted under the approval route, an approval will still be required if it is to be, uh, if the business has to be done through a LLP. Uh, again, a downstream investment by the LLP say is subject to similar conditions. So, an LLP, an LLP is established in India. 
it uh, 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 again further invest in another company. It does not do business directly, but it uh, if it has to further do a investment, it can do an investment only in those sectors where there is no government. It's under automatic route or there is no government approval required. So the LAP cannot indirectly or directly operate in a uh, sector which requires government approval without the approval of the government. Uh, again, uh, 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 the policy defines what is ownership and control. So it says uh, when is an uh, when is an LLP said to be owned and controlled by residents? When is an LLP owned and controlled by non-residents? And uh, uh, the norms for downstream uh, uh, investment have been aligned again throughout the FDI policy as well to fit in even LLPs. Uh, so, the, uh, with this broad policy uh, change, uh, we had a few uh, quick uh, thoughts uh, uh, to bounce off. Uh, basically, uh, what would be the procedure for investment in sectors where 100% FDI is not allowed or is allowed to allow subject to conditions? So, uh, for example, there is a sectoral cap that, uh, for example, in uh, defense, FDI in defense is allowed only up to 49%. So, now in such areas, 49% uh, are the automatic route. Beyond 49%, uh, again, you require the approval of the uh, government. So, in such sectors, can an LLP operate? Can an LLP operate in, uh, say, uh, broadcasting of uh, news channels? These are all sectors regulated by the government. Any investment then requires the approval of the government. So, if the LLP has to operate in such sectors, what should be done? So the, the answer is pretty straightforward here after a bit of deliberation that it can go for it subject to government approval. Uh, again, now uh, the law, the, the policy has mentioned that there is FDI permitted in an LLP. There is foreign direct investment in an LLP. So, and uh, for a non resident can take a capital share in the uh, uh, LLP. But uh, what about uh, other modes of uh, other kinds of investors such as foreign portfolio investors such as venture capital funds, PE investors, and what are, uh, and FECI again uh, foreign venture capital investors? Would such investment by such parties also be permitted in an LLP? Right now, uh, the policy mentions only FDI. FDI would only be uh, a direct investment and not through such uh, a, a person such as. Uh, Portfolio investors, venture capital investors, they are a separate group of investors under the uh, FDI regime. So, when, when FDI in LLP is permitted under the automatic group, the question is what about portfolio investors and venture capital investors? Uh, uh, not much clarity on that. Uh, uh, again, uh, next comes uh, mode of consideration for investment in LLP. So, uh, if investment has to be made in companies, I invest in the equity capital of a company and I have to remit cash. Uh, I can also convert uh, ECBs into equity. Uh, I can also convert outstanding uh, uh, royalty dues into equity and uh, translate that into FDI. All these are various modes of uh, FDI in a company. Now, what about in an LLP? Can uh, a, a similar logic be extended even to an LLP? So, for example, uh, uh, there is an LLP set up uh, by an investment. Uh, automatic route. Later on, he extends a loan to the uh, ECB, extends a loan to the uh, uh, LLP. Thereafter, uh, the loan is not repaid, and uh, as per the commercial, uh, as per the terms of the ECB, it's supposed to be converted into a share, share uh, capital of the LLP. Can this be done? Okay. Is this permitted? Can is conversion of loan into equity permitted and considered as FDI in the LLP? So that is a, a, a question which uh, we had. Uh, and then again, uh, who, uh, would a conversion of a, a company into an LLP again be permitted under the automatic rule? Or do we have to go to the government to seek a specific approval? There is no, uh, there is not much clarity presently on these aspects. Moving on, uh, 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 FDI is in investing companies. So uh, earlier, uh, uh, under the prior, prior to the policy amendment, uh, FDI in an investing company, basically an entity which does not undertake solid activities, it only undertakes investment in, in other companies, required the prior approval of the government. It wasn't under the automatic rule. But uh, 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 with this policy amendment, um, 
FDI is permitted in an investing company, that is a pure holding company, so to say, under the automatic route without any approvals, provided the uh, uh, the activities of the investing uh, investee company is wholly in sectors where uh, sectors which are permitted for investment under the automatic route. Say, for example, software. So uh, we have uh, uh, a foreign non-resident. He invests in an investing company with the sole object of investing further in companies doing software development. So that is something which is permitted because software development is under the automatic route. But if this was to happen in, uh, 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 so to say, uh, uh, restricted sector, say such as the defense sector, uh, there is an investing company which will enter into joint ventures uh, for undertaking defense manufacturing. Would that be permitted here? So that is uh, that uh, that will not be permitted because there uh, defense is a regulated sector which requires the approval of the government. So such an investing company should. Uh, uh, investment in such investing company requires the approval of the government. Uh, this this amendment can be looked at as ushering uh, in uh, an Indian holding company for foreign investors. So, for example, that investing company can act as the SPV or set up multiple SPVs, so to say, rather than uh, rather can invest in SPVs in permitted sectors. Uh, this also brings in a lot of structuring opportunities for inbound investments. Earlier, we uh, hardly used to look at uh, Indian uh, holding companies because one of the biggest restrictions was uh, the Indian uh, FDI policy which did not permit an Indian holding company for a non investment But uh, with uh, this amendment, uh, inbound investments uh, 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 can be looked at with an Indian holding company as well. Uh, the next question is uh, whether that investing company can have multiple subsidiaries like you know, we saw in Vodafone. Uh, they had about uh, uh, 10 to 12 layers of holding companies from the ultimate holding company to Vodafone India. So can we have something like that? Uh, under the, the Indian company law, we cannot have more than two layers of subsidiaries. So that is, uh, this uh, this question is repelled more, more by the Companies Act rather than the FEMA itself. So since the Companies Act does not permit more than two layers, it's unlikely that, uh, not that it's unlikely, multiple step down subsidies will not be possible. Uh, and uh, then can these companies avail of ECBs? So uh, the function of these companies would be to invest in further companies and to invest they require funds. Uh, and for such funds can they look at ECBs? That is the question. And here the NPA policy doesn't give any guidance. We have to again go back to the ECB rules. And if we see the ECB rules, who are the eligible borrowers? Companies, investing companies would generally not make it. Investment companies would generally not be eligible for availing of such loans. When we discuss the ECD policy update, I just uh, uh, come back to this again. Uh, this is another major amendment which was uh, brought up in the API policy in Ananda. Uh, after this, uh, 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 there is also this amendment on swap of shares. Earlier, uh, uh, for example, an Indian company, uh, there is an Indian company and a uh, uh, non-resident company. The Indian company acquires shares of that non-resident company. As a consideration for uh, for acquiring those shares, the Indian company gives its own shares to the non-resident shareholders. So that would be an outward link, an outward investment, as well as an inward investment. The swap of shares arrangement. So earlier, while the outbound investment did not have any restrictions so long as it complied with the ODI regulations. The inward limb required the approval of the Foreign Investment Promotion Board, FITB. That was the uh, requirement earlier. Now with this policy amendment, this FITB approval is done away with. So the, even the, so the out, so uh, in, in the example which I gave, the Indian company can issue its shares to the shareholders of the non-resident company which is without going to the FITB. <laughs> This is also another major policy amendment because uh, uh, if we track the FIPB uh, uh, news alerts uh, which, which are put up on FIPB website, lot of lot of proposals before the FIPB used to be on staff of shares. And uh, uh, one of the uh, guiding principles for the amendment uh, for, for this uh, policy change, uh, which was circulated in uh, November, uh, was that. Uh, uh, 
investors' time should not be wasted on by making applications to the FIP. That was exactly the words uh, which they had used. So uh, by uh, so it's a very proactive kind of a thinking by the government of India, and uh, and uh, 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 I believe that they have a lot of faith on the RBI's control uh, systems to track all of these rather than. You know, uh, making a visit to Delhi, uh, approaching the FIPP, getting the approval, chasing them, fixing, putting up those uh, proposals before the FIPP and wasting that time. The, the government has appreciated how uh, uh, irrelevant that was and it has relaxed that requirement. The other uh, important update uh, uh, amendment is uh, in uh, sectors under the government approval route. Um, uh, so earlier, uh, 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 approvals. So the, now the approval is required for establishing Indian companies in sectors only in sectors under government approval route only. And uh, say for example, uh, there is a transfer of ownership or control from Western citizens to non-residents. Say for example, a uh, uh, software company is owned, owned wholly by Indian. Uh, uh, Indian residents. It's a wholly homegrown Indian software development company. That software development, uh, the, the promoters of that company want to transfer their shares to the non residents. So, earlier, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the policy mandate was that only in specified sectors was such transfer requiring government approval. So, they had uh, investments in companies in the print media. Uh, civil aviation, etc. So, if a civil aviation company was uh, uh, civil aviation company was owned by resident individuals or resident uh, shareholders, and that was supposed to be proposed to be transferred to a uh, set of non-residents, that required government approval. Uh, and there was a, there was a laundry list of uh, sectors which came under that ambit. Now, this policy amendment, uh, which is deliberating, this policy amendment removes that laundry list such that it appears as if approval is required for all entities including software development companies uh, uh, who are wholly Indian owned and they want to transfer their shares to non-resident such that that company will become a non-resident controlled company. Earlier it was only for a specified list but now it seems to have uh, been expanded to all sectors. This is quite interesting in the sense uh, earlier uh, the government had mandated that only for those sectors you come to me for an approval. Now uh, uh, we are just thinking through deliberating on that amendment and it appeared to us that hasn't the government uh, overstepped and uh, said that for all uh, transfer of shares, transfer of control from an Indian shareholder to a non-resident shareholder, you require my, my approval. Isn't this tightening the API policy? It's just uh, uh, deliberating on it. Uh, so you have anything to add? I think the point that uh, Bharat is trying to make here is that uh, whenever there is a sectoral cap or that which came under the automatic route earlier, by virtue of this amendment, the way it is worded, it is made that wherever there is transfer of ownership from a resident to a non-resident in respect of where approval is required then that has been done away with. But it does not deal with those sectors which are already there under the automatic. So does that by implication mean that in those sectors where automatic approval was already available and if you are trying to transfer ownership from resident to a non-resident that you should go through an approval route. Keeping the intent in mind, the objective and the policy where the way it is focused, I think it is only a matter of time that the clarification will come that in such cases this is not the intent that we do not want to create further hardships, rather we wanted to labor life. I feel, you know, there would be a clarification if it is raised at a point and uh, it's not to create further hardship rather than uh, create more ease of doing business here. That would be it. Uh, that seemed to us uh, as if uh, we are uh, taking two steps back, but uh, we'll, uh, we, uh, let's just hope uh, for a clarification. It's not linked to the previous transfer of ownership control from residents to 
there, uh, there looks like there's going to be a lot more uh, in the offing for uh, NRIs and uh, let's hope that uh, it gets extended to earlier investments as well. Then uh, the point uh, which I briefly mentioned, uh, now with that investment being regarded as a domestic investment, would that Indian company which is so set up by these NRIs be required to uh, 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 file the FCGPR? Would the transfer of such, uh, uh, would the transfer of shares in this Indian entity be required to be reported in uh, form FCTRS? Would the transfer of the shares be required to comply with the valuation norms? Would the Indian company be required to file uh, the annual return on uh, foreign liabilities uh, and assets? So, uh, because we have characterized it as a domestic investment, our view is that these compliances will automatically fall away. So, life is much easier for such NRI investee companies. Uh, but then, uh, the next question which we uh, had was, uh, uh, since it's regarded as a domestic com a domestic investment, would, uh, uh, this, these, uh, would these NRIs now be permitted to invest in companies who will be engaged in uh, activities such as real estate, agriculture, etc., which are prohibited under the FDI policy. <coughs> activities such as real estate and agriculture are prohibited. Uh, uh, Non-residents are not permitted to engage in real estate. So, but now that here uh, uh, the uh, uh, NRI investment will be regarded as a domestic investment, can these NRIs engage in real estate activity? So, uh, uh, the view which uh, we had uh, was that. Uh, no, uh, this is only a, a deeming fiction uh, for the purpose of exchanging a benefit to uh, uh, NRIs and this deeming fiction cannot be extended to prohibited activities. So, uh, investing in a real estate trading company is still a no-no for an NRI and uh, 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 which, which can't even go through the approval. Sir, so this company is controlled, no? company trust partnership controlled by NRIs. Yes. Only, uh, they should be controlled or you know, partly controlled? What is the percentage? Uh, there are definitions on what is owned and controlled by NRIs. Uh, they mention uh, that uh, the prime, the key decision making or somewhere close to 51% yeah. is, uh, is held by the NRIs. Yeah. The right to appoint directors where the management control is uh, with the non-resident entity and that is supposed to be a foreign control. Similarly, if the control is with the resident Indian, then it is a, a, a resident control entity. Whether it be by way of board of directors or by way of designated parties in case of LLP. LLP is also included in this list. <coughs> yeah, LLP you must read it to the extent that it is under the uh, automatic route. Whatever is applicable for companies under the automatic route without the government approval, same thing will apply for an LLP. NRI LLP, huh. because here we only written companies trust partnerships, huh? so whether LLP is also included? I no, investment by an NRI through companies, so uh, the NRI owns a company in, uh, in US, yeah. assume. NRI wholly owns that US company, that US company will be permitted to invest in India and that investment will be regarded as a domestic. NRI owns the LLP in US, sir. Uh, it's still a, a partner, uh, LLP in US, yeah. I think it will still be uh, covered. Covered. HUF? HUF, uh, I'm not sure whether, uh, sir, is that concept uh, there outside? Yes. No, HUF is still a uh, gray area because see, HUF as a legal entity is not uh, uh, recognized as uh, part of the investment schemes. So, FDI per se does not deal with uh, uh, HUF constitution. I think we need uh, more clarity on that. We don't have an answer right now. Because I think uh, Tata Sons is an issue of uh, Tata Sons is a uh, trust, section 25, or section 8 now. This uh, notification, 12 of November. Yeah, which not That's November. Not, yeah, that one. Real estate uh, business, I think they are, they are trying to uh, soft, soften that. Yeah. And they say that investment in uh, uh, what is that? Residential flats and all those things will be permitted. And real estate business they have defined in a different way. Yeah, that was always there. See, here what they have done with this, there were certain minimum uh, construction area, uh, constructed area which would require to be no, done. Those have been done away with. There was lock-in periods for investment which have been liberalized or eased out. 
and even earlier, see the trading in real estate was anyway prohibited. Now they have come out with a little more clarity in terms of saying or easing it out in saying that hotels, resorts, hospitals, educational institutions, in these kind of uh, activities, yeah, they have liberalized the kind of investment that can be brought in. They have done away with the minimum uh, built-in criteria, they have done away with the uh, lock-in period for certain cases and those kind of liberalizing, uh, liberalized measures have been brought in. Okay, but I, I think in the course of this we will discuss those aspects as well. That is on the uh, on uh, giving the red carpet for NRA. And then uh, again, uh, investment in certain uh, agricultural activities and allied sectors have been expanded. Earlier, the uh, uh, FDI in uh, FDI was uh, permitted only in tea plantations, but now it's been expanded to cover coffee plantations, rubber, cardamom. Palm oil tree, uh, olive oil tree plantations uh, also. So on a lighter note, uh, we were just discussing this amendment. We were just thinking that uh, already coffee plantation prices are uh, high, in, at least in Karnataka. We go to towards Chikmagalore. Foreign investment also being permitted. Uh, wouldn't it uh, make them costlier? Uh, then uh, another major amendment uh, was in the. Uh, uh, is an FDI in defense. So uh, earlier the uh, uh, FDI was permitted in defense up to 49 percent under the government rule. So beyond 49 percent, it was a prohibited area. Uh, to invest even say 1 percent, we had to approach the government. But now uh, it's been liberalized. It's uh, mentioned that uh, uh, approval would be required only if it is if it goes beyond uh, 49 percent. And up to 49 percent, it is under the automatic rule. Again. Beyond 49% earlier, uh, proposals had to be put up before the cabinet committee uh, on uh, uh, security, and uh, but now it's been uh, uh, it's now going to go through the foreign investment promotion board. Uh, again, that is again subject uh, to that foreign investment beyond 49% uh, being called for uh, uh, in light of modern and state of the art technology being required. If you require modern and the way it looks is, if you require modern and state of the art technology to come in and for that reason you you want to have a higher investment, only then we will permit it. Again, uh, these are more of, uh, 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 the, these uh, policy amendments look more of uh, technical uh, aspects rather than the uh, broad agenda or intention of the government which still, which is that uh, even though defense is a sensitive area, we are open to uh, FDI. So uh, that is what the policy still uh, announces. Uh, again, uh, then the uh, next question is uh, 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 automatic route of up to 49%. It mentions that it is FDI which is under the automatic route uh, up to 49%. The next question is what about FPIs and FIAs? Would they also be uh, covered under that 49% uh, uh, or what? Earlier uh, there was uh, this clarity. But uh, this, uh, the, the update, the, the press note well does not uh, seem to mention anything of that kind. Uh, so we just may have to uh, await for some clarification on that. And then uh, another uh, point which is made is that uh, uh, FDI is permitted on the automatic route up to 49% if industrial license is acquired by that company. If industrial license is not acquired by that company, is not sought by that company, then even 1% investment requires government approval. So that is the point in the fourth bullet. In case industrial license not sought, investment and transfer subject to government approval. So uh, the intention is that you will, you will invest in that company and that company will manufacture uh, defense products and to manufacture the defense products it will apply for an industrial license uh, with the DITP and the Ministry of Commerce and uh, that will be under the automatic but suppose the licensing application is not sought, proposed to be made, then the investment will have to go through the government sector. So basically, they do not want to uh, let go of the uh, uh, of the technical control on defense investments. They still want to have some kind of control, and uh, I think that is where this uh, uh, amendment uh, is. I just like to make a point here. Going forward. Uh, again, the whole idea is to go through and make FIPP the single medical low clearance agency. 
So while the industrial license is being looked at, I uh, strongly believe that it will also be rooted through the FIPB and it will not be a necessity for one to go and make a separate application for the industrial license and it would be also handled through the FIPB uh, single route of the That would uh, go a long way in promoting the ease of doing business. Uh, so that is the answer to the uh, question below the fifth, uh, fifth uh, bullet. The industrial license is issued by the DIPP and Ministry of Commerce in consultation with the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of External Affairs. Now, how will we make the application? Are we made to make the application to the DIP and to the Ministry of Commerce or what? So, the, the, the answer lies in the fact that, uh, uh, in the point which Kata has just made, that FIPB is the place where we will make the application and FIPB will be the single window where all these FDI applications include and industrial license applications will first hit. Then uh, again as a broad policy point uh, what is mentioned is that FDI is subject to MOD, the Ministry of Defence Security Clearance and Guidance and there is a need for the industry company to be self-sufficient in areas of product design and development. Again uh, we are just wondering whether this waters down the automatic route uh, who, who have which uh, the government is making, but again, the broad policy seems to be that uh, we are welcome to FDI in defense, but we still want to retain a semblance of control into the kind of FDI which is going in. So, uh, 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 these statements in the FDI policy should be read in that backdrop. Uh, again, uh, a few more sensitive sectors uh, liberalized uh, FDI in teleports, uh, direct to home, uh, multi system operators, that is, our cable operators mobile TV and head in, the, head in the sky broadcasting is permitted up to 100% from the earlier 74. Uh, there again now we have 49% under the auto, uh, automatic route and beyond 49 up to 100 is under the uh, approval route. Earlier uh, we had it uh, uh, as uh, beyond 49 and up to 74, now we have beyond 49 and up to 100 as the approval route. Again uh, FBI and FM radio and upbringing of news channels. Uh, 49 uh, investment up to 49 percent under the government route. Earlier investment was permitted only up to 26 percent under the government approved route. Correct. They will form a company. They will form uh, possibly a joint venture. No, basically the way this would work is uh, the uh, foreign Get that business, you have to go through the tender route. Yes. Then, 
then the first thing is first we have to have a setup over here. What is the idea behind having a setup first? Then we may get or may not get the tender. That's what he is trying to say. Okay. If you are talking about the uncertainties, we will have to leave it to them to take a commercial judgment on that. But if you if you have, let's say you are already supplying, if you are already supplying to the Indian defense sector, and then it definitely does make sense for you to be able to uh, establish your uh, manufacturing capabilities in India and perhaps get more business out of it. You can still explore, nobody says, I mean, see, tomorrow, uh, uh, supposing you have two competitors, one has set up a facility in India, I am sure, uh, I mean, there will be more uh, cre uh, credibility and uh, weightage given for that. Will there be a person who doesn't have a manufacturing facility in India, those currently supplied to the different sector? Uh, fewer, uh, yeah, to answer your second part of the question, whether they will be allowed to export in India. Now, wherever there could be proprietary rights which belong to the Defence Ministry, I think that would be because by virtue of the uh, uh, requirements under the Secrecy Act, those would all be restricted, but the others can be exported. Yes, and who knows, we could be leaders in developing the technology. Uh, and especially, sir, uh, once they have to manufacture, they also have to affect that industrial license. And uh, in the way that industrial license application, I think they need to give a projection of sales, exports, imports, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, there will be some data points captured in that IL application. Uh, and uh, maybe the government will look at that also favorably. Yeah. Uh, another sensitive uh, sector which has been opened up, uh, uplinking of non-news channels. Uplinking of news channels is uh, uh, closely held, so th that's restricted to 49%. But when it comes to non-news channels, say entertainment channels, uh, uh, ATI has been now permitted uh, up to 100% under the automatic route. All the investments in all the uh, uh, in the sector which we just discussed are subject to the owned and controlled uh, uh, conditions. Uh, which are spread throughout the API policy. Uh, now, uh, another major set of amendments have happened in uh, API in real estate. Uh, while uh, real estate, trading, agriculture continue to be prohibited sectors, there has been a relaxation, as uh, Parthas sir uh, just briefly explained earlier, there has been a relaxation uh, by doing away with the uh, minimum area development norms. There was the requirement that uh, uh, the minimum area which has to be developed by an FBI investing company uh, should be 20,000 square meters, but now that has been done with it. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a locking period of three years uh, earlier, so if the foreign investor has invested today, to take out his money only three years later, and there were a host of other conditions also which were mentioned saying uh, uh, there should be uh, this degree of uh, infrastructure already available, uh, uh, present in that uh, uh, real estate uh, project before you could exit, but uh, now these uh, uh, these conditions have been uh, uh, removed. Uh, uh, but then uh, uh, there was also the minimum FDI requirement of $5 million. Uh, basically, the uh, non-resident should have invested $5 million within six months of the commencement of the project. But this requirement has now been removed. Then. Uh, 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 the three-year lock-in period will not apply to uh, sectors such as hotels, tourist resorts, hospitals, educational institutions. So this is a, a, a major uh, amendment and 100% FDI is uh, permitted in completed projects for ownership and uh, operation and management of townships, malls, shopping complexes, business centers, again subject to the lock-in period. Uh, this is one uh, major area of utilization. The next area is uh, uh, wholesale cash and uh, carry. Uh, uh, largely, uh, although there was a lot of uh, news that uh, news and lobbying which was happening for liberalization of uh, wholesale cash and carry, single brand retaining, multi brand uh, retaining, press note does not contain any such major policy amendments to that. It sticks to the uh, it sticks to the existing guidelines, uh, but. Uh, uh, 
it only opens up a small window saying uh, 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 entities who are engaged, already engaged in uh, wholesale cash and carry trade or who will engage in who will engage in wholesale cash and carry trade can also be engaged in uh, single brand uh, retailing subject to them maintaining separate books of accounts. So this is a minor uh, amendment. Uh, similarly, for uh, single brand uh, retailing, uh, not uh, uh, not uh, uh, not a set of amendments which uh, the uh, the major players were looking at, but some degree of liberalisation. Uh, now, what is permitted is a single brand retailing entity which currently operates through brick and mortar stores will also be permitted to operate through the e-commerce mode. Otherwise, uh, there is not much uh, uh, again. Now uh, stepping back, uh, we can see that, that there is a lot of uh, 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 news and uh, uh, views on whether uh, Flipkart, which is engaged in e-commerce, and Flipkart has a lot of foreign investment, uh, is uh, falling foul or is in line with the FBI policy. There was a lot of news, there was a lot of lobbying around. Uh, that issue still remains in the open. And, uh, uh, the only clarity which has come out through PN Press Note 12 is that a single brand retail stores can go the e-commerce route. Yeah, I would just like to add here, yeah. see the existing scenario generally was a B2B trade, a business to business uh, trade through the uh, e-commerce route was considered as something which was permitted and was under the automatic rule. But a B2C was always looked at as a retail trade and therefore the restrictions on uh, uh, investment, foreign investment in respect of such businesses was guided by the fact that either an approval would be required. Obviously, uh, a single brand retail also would be doing, you know, a B2C model through the e-commerce rule. But that implied that B2C is not something which comes under the automatic rule. They have just provided that single brand can go ahead and do e-commerce and that is to say a B2C model without obtaining the moment of approval. Uh, that is one, one uh, dimension of the liberalization. The other dimension is again uh, coming from uh, uh, the Make in India uh, uh, idea which the Prime Minister has been pushing. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the rules now permit uh, an Indian manufacturer to sell its own branded products in any manner. Again, uh, who is an Indian manufacturer? 70% of the goods should be manufactured by that entity and 30% if it's not manufactured, it's, it should be sourced from Indian manufacturers. So all the goods again uh, should have a uh, India origin. So that is when a manufacturer would be regarded as an Indian manufacturer and such a manufacturer would be permitted to sell the sell his goods through any manner uh, uh, he wishes to. Again, this goes back to the definition of manufacturer which was introduced, uh, which uh, uh, we went through at the beginning uh, of this discussion. Uh, again, uh, uh, another silver lining in the uh, uh, single brand retail uh, regulations is on the relaxation of sourcing norms for entities undertaking the single brand retailing. So, uh, uh, the, uh, currently the requirement is that uh, there has to be at least 30% of the goods should be sourced locally. And there is a preference for sourcing it from uh, 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 SMEs, small and medium enterprises. However, if the entity, uh, single brand retailing entity is able to demonstrate that it is selling goods which require state of the art and cutting edge technology and local sourcing is not possible, in such situations, on a case-by-case -case basis, the government is willing to relax the sourcing norms. It is not a general permission, it is a specific case-by-case -case permission which is granted, provided the entity establishes or demonstrates that the good which is, it is selling in India requires state of the art and cutting edge technology. Mm -hmm. The sourcing norms have to be made from the day the company is set up or when the store is first set up? Sorry, sir, come again. The sourcing norms, do they need to be met at the time the company itself is incorporated or subsequently at the time the store start operating? Yeah, uh, I think you have to give an undertaking first when you set up and that would need to be uh, 
you know, monitored by way of the reporting requirement. So that's how the check could be maintained. And I think there's a, there's a self certification uh, Which system. Is the So uh, again, uh, 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 as uh, we mentioned, there is lack of clarity on whether e-commerce firms, uh, whether it's foreign holding, whether they, whether the activities which they are doing in India are uh, are uh, under the green uh, signal or is there any red flag? There is no guidance in the press note on that. Uh, there have been no amendments on the regulations which govern uh, multi-brand retailing. Um, yeah, so those are the main uh, salient amendments uh, which were brought in in the FDI policy. Again, uh, all of uh, the, 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 the uh, single thread which runs through all of the amendments is that the government is rolling out the red carpet to investors, although not uh, as expected, especially in uh, single brand retailing and multi brand retailing. But uh, there is this intention that yes, we require foreign direct investment, and for that, we are relaxing the rules, and this is what we are doing. So, that is something which is clearly signaled by the FDI policy amendment. Uh, moving on from here, uh, the ECB liberalization, uh, which was announced uh, by the RBI. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, external commercial borrowings have been uh, uh, looked at as strong tools for capital account management. And uh, 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 as uh, I mentioned, uh, the RBI donor has specifically mentioned that this ECB liberalization is in line with this policy of calibrating the capital account management. And uh, they have laid down a few overarching principles which, which have guided this uh, ECB liberalization. And uh, uh, they are again uh, a more liberal approach with uh, fewer restrictions on end users, higher all in cost ceilings, etc., for long term foreign currency borrowings. Uh, and then a more liberal regime for INR den denominated CDs. Again, uh, ECDs uh, would generally be external commercial borrowings in foreign currency. Uh, this would entail the Indian borrower to bear foreign uh, currency risks on the loan which he has taken. Uh, again, uh, the, the government of India is strongly advocating the INR uh, denominated ECDs, where, where Indian entities need not bear that foreign exchange risk. It will be an INR loan in their books. And so, to promote more of such INR denominated ECDs, the rules have been more relaxed. Vis a vis are the foreign currency denominated ECBs. Uh, again, uh, the, the ECB policy is sought to be uh, liberalized by expanding the list of overseas lenders to include long term lenders such as insurance companies, pension funds, all in their funds. These players have become very important in the international market over the past, uh, 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 past few years. And uh, these entities have been uh, recognized by the uh, ECB policy you now. And uh, supposedly there is a small negative list of reduced restrictions applicable in case of long term ECBs. Uh, and then uh, the other principle running through the ECB policy is on uh, uh, alignment of the list of infrastructure entities eligible for ECB with the harmonization of the government of India. This is more of an operational uh, amendment rather than a policy uh, uh, change. Now uh, uh, the, uh, the current ECB policy looks at any ECB. Uh, at uh, basis, basis three tracks, track one, track two, track three. So in track one we have uh, the medium term foreign currency denominated ECBs which we are familiar with basically the uh, ECBs which have a tenure of three to five years. Then in track two we have long term foreign currency denominated ECBs with minimum average maturity of ten years. And then track 3, we have INR denominated ECBs with minimum average maturity of uh, 3 to 5 years. So the focus of the government of India is on track 3. And when it comes to track 3, the oil cost ceilings are liberalized, end use restrictions are liberalized, permitted uh, uh, borrowers, lenders have been liberalized vis a vis track 1 and track 2. We will go through that in the subsequent slides. Uh, a key operational, uh, a key day to day question which we get is whether, say, for example, software development companies or, say, marketing support companies in India can avail of ECBs. The, uh, uh, all, uh, when, when the ECB policy was first enunciated and for a long period of time, uh, such service companies uh, were not uh, entitled to avail of external commercial products. Uh, uh, however, recent, uh, a few years back, this uh, 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 software development companies were permitted to avail of ECBs. After that, uh, 
I think it's only hotels and uh, hospitals which have been permitted. Apart from that, no other service entity is still eligible for uh, availing an ECB. That continues to remain. Uh, there has been no change on that. Uh, we'll, I'm sorry, we'll uh, just uh, go through that subsequently. So, uh, the question which you face is, uh, can I borrow from my parent? So, for, for that, the ECB uh, policy had already defined who is a foreign equity holder from whom we can uh, borrow. So, a direct foreign equity holder with minimum 25% direct equity holding, indirect equity holder with minimum indirect equity holding of 51% and a group company with a common overseas parent were eligible lenders. We could borrow from any of these parties. This continues to remain, there has been no further liberalization of this. Again, uh, now coming to who are the eligible borrowers under each of the three so-called tracks. Track 1, eligible borrower would be uh, companies engaged in manufacturing and software development sectors. Again, as I mentioned, uh, service companies not permitted. Uh, shipping and airline companies, CIDB that is the small industries developing Bank of India. Units in special economic zones uh, and the exam bank. Uh, so here, uh, 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 one question which we had was, so for example, the service company is operating wholly out of uh, an SEZ. It is wholly operating from say multiple units in an SEZ. The question is whether that entity would be eligible to claim or would be eligible to uh, take an ECB, even though it's a service company. Uh, the way the, 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 uh, the policy reads, there seems to be no restriction on that. So, uh, guess we can uh, take, take it that if a service company is operating out of an ECZ, it can still avail of the ECB. Then we have Track 2. Uh, eligible borrowers for Track 2 ECBs would be uh, all entities listed under Track 1. Basically, Track 2 would be a long term foreign currency denominated ECB. All entities listed under Track 1, companies in the infrastructure sector, holding companies, core investment companies, uh, real estate investment trusts. Infrastructure investment trust coming under the regulatory framework of the SEBI. Uh, For track 3, that is Indian uh, INR denominated ECBs, all the entities which we saw in track 1 and track 2, in addition to that, NBFCs, NBFC microfinancial institutions, not for profit companies, societies, etc., companies engaged in miscellaneous services. Uh, and SEZ and NMIZ developers. NMIZ are basically a national manufacturing and investment zone. Uh, those developers can, away, can opt for the INR uh, denominated ECDs. Basically, the kind of companies who can opt for an INR, who can go for an INR denominated ECB is very big. The intention of the government is to promote more of INR denominated ECDs. Again, the eligible lenders uh, for uh, for uh, all these three kinds of ECBs, track one basically are uh, medium term uh, ECBs. Uh, we have uh, uh, international banks, international capital markets, multilateral financial institutions like the International Financial Corporation, etc., export credit agencies, suppliers of equipment, foreign equity holders who we discussed earlier, overseas long term investors, basically your sovereign wealth funds pension funds, foreign insurance companies, etc. And overseas branches, subsidiaries of Indian banks would be eligible lenders of medium term foreign currency denominated <coughs> ECBs. As regards track 2 ECBs, uh, uh, it's primarily all entities listed on track 1 except overseas branches. Basically, they do not want overseas branches to expose themselves to long term borrowings. Uh, track 3 uh, ECBs, uh, all entities listed on track 1, except overseas branches and uh, subsidiaries of Indian banks, NBFCs, mutual fund, um, microfinance institutions, other eligible uh, MFIs, NGOs can avail, NGOs again can avail from overseas organizations and individuals. So, overseas organizations and individuals can subscribe, can lend in INR. This is a signal change vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the current policy where overseas organizations are, and individuals are not at all recognized as permitted lenders. So we have, uh, say, suppose uh, uh, NGOs who would want uh, uh, some kind of a donation, but uh, an overseas guy is not willing to give a donation, but instead wants to give a loan. He can give it in INR and still uh, uh, achieve his charitable objective or 
whatever intention he has with the NGO. So that is on the eligible lenders. Uh, basically, the list of eligible lenders for Track 3 ECDs is huge. And that is in line with the policy of promoting INR denominated ECDs. Again, uh, the all in cost ceilings, they have been marginally uh, increased uh, for your Track 1 uh, ECDs uh, with a minimum average maturity of 3 to 5 years. Uh, the, the all in cost should be within 300 basis points over the 6 month LIBOR on the applicable benchmark. For ECDs with uh, minimum or average maturity of more than 5 years, 450 basis points was over uh, the 6 month LIBOR of the benchmark. And the PNR interest should not exceed 2% above the contracted rate of interest. The all-in cost for track 2 is slightly higher than the all-in cost uh, for track 1. It goes up to 500 basis points. The penal interest clause continues. For track 3, there is no restriction. Whatever is dictated by the market is considered as the all-in cost. So, this is clearly the signal of the, from the government that as long as it is an INR denominated ECB, I have no problem. You borrow it at whatever price the market deems fit. Uh, again, uh, permitted end use for each of the uh, 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 ECB categories. Uh, primarily, the focus is uh, towards capital expenditure and not working capital. That is still prohibited. That is still a prohibited end use. So, uh, uh, an ECB cannot be taken to cater to the salary obligation, etc. Anything, the, the end use should be towards capital expenditure, import of capital equipment, import of services, local sourcing of capital goods new uh, funding of a new project, modernizing an existing unit or overseas direct investment or refinancing of a trade credit. These are only the permitted uh, end uses for track 1 ECBs. For track 2 ECBs, uh, all purposes, all uh, 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 the other purposes which we discussed on the track 1, excluding real estate, sorry, all purposes would be in all purposes, excluding uh, real estate, capital market investment, domestic equity investment, on lending, purchase of land. These are the activities for which loan cannot be taken. And the, uh, we, we saw earlier that uh, for a track to ECB, a holding company is an eligible borrower. Uh, the permitted end use for a, for a holding company would be to use the ECB for loans in infrastructure experience. So basically for say for road construction or uh, uh, infrastructure, any other form of infrastructure development, the ECB can be used. Again, this is in line uh, broadly with the uh, liberal uh, uh, regime which is presently there on uh, funding of infrastructure projects. Uh, we find the government uh, uh, permitting the infrastructure lending at low rates, encouraging infrastructure uh, lending uh, from outside India, from multilateral institutions. So, this is again in line with that policy. Uh, when it comes to rupee denominated uh, ECBs, uh, NBFCs can use them for on lending to the infrastructure sector, providing high quality capital loans to domestic entities, leasing of capex to uh, domestic entities, uh, lease of capital equipment. Sorry. For SEZ and NMIZ developers who are one of the recognized lenders for uh, rupee denominated uh, ECBs, uh, for providing infrastructure facilities, again the focus is towards infrastructure development. For NBFC MFIs for on lending to self help groups for micro credit. We also saw that microfinance institutions are eligible borrowers. So for such uh, borrowers, they can use it only to promote self help financing. Uh, apart from that, the other key amendments are, in, uh, are for giving a general permission for creating charge on immobile or movable properties to avail of that ECB. Uh, the no restrictions, uh, only the authorized dealer, the banker should be intimated that we are willing this ECB for which we need to give this pledge, this asset as a security. Uh, that's it, no further uh, intimation required. And then the debt equity ratio uh, is governed by the leverage ratio prescribed by sectoral prudential regulator. Say for example, we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, NB, uh, NBFC borrowing, uh, going for an ECB. There it will be governed by the uh, debt equity ratio as prescribed by the RBI for NBFCs. However, for example, for companies, if companies have to go for uh, uh, an ECB, the debt equity ratio uh, uh, should not exceed 4, four is to 1 if the, bar, if the lender is the group company. And for ECB obtained under the, the approval route, the debt equity ratio should not exceed 7 is to 1. 
So for every rupee of equity, the debt should not exceed 7 rupees. So uh, these are the major uh, liberalization uh, uh, agenda points uh, in the ECB policy. Um, so uh, so any thoughts? Uh, any more? Uh, any thoughts? Uh, from that on the ECB? Yeah. <clears throat> As the, uh, the flavor as well it comes out in all this liberalization method is again, we come down to the bottom line. Bottom line is go ahead, promote make in India, uh, promote skill India and you are likely to get a preferential treatment. And the ECB route has been uh, quite a welcome measure for the infrastructure uh, sector. The liberalization was to happen because that's the area where we need the maximum funding. So it is much natural that not only the FDI but also the ECB route needed to be liberalized if we wanted to develop our infrastructure sector. So uh, I think the initiatives have been shown, now we must wait and watch how much of the actual inflow happens. And uh, hopefully with the scenario of what it is globally, definitely India's infrastructure sector is a sector to work. So uh, these are the two major policy announcements which happened in November and uh, which are which we look forward will have a significant impact on foreign investment flows into India and foreign investment activity in India. So uh, apart from these two major uh, amendments, there were a few minor uh, uh, other amendments in the uh, here in the uh, FEMA regulations rules. We will go through that. Uh, one is again uh, this is again linked to the FDI policy. Uh, FDI in white table ATM operations. So uh, ATMs all this while have been run by banks. Uh, so uh, the RBI uh, and the government of India, they, they initiated this policy of uh, ushering in white label ATMs. Basically, white table ATMs are not operated by banks. They are operated by non-bank entities, uh, who are primarily say NBFCs, or they need not even be NBFC. So at least in Bangalore, we have seen, uh, I think, Tata and Cash, which has these ATMs and uh, that is what is called as white label ATMs and uh, again uh, uh, as soon as uh, if you recollect uh, one, uh, once the NDA government uh, uh, took over they, they, they actively and strenuously promoted uh, bank account openings across the country and uh, but uh, at the same time uh, we were facing uh, we, we were seeing on our mobiles that uh, if we swipe our cards at, uh, uh, at non uh, at other bank ATMs, we would be charged soon. So uh, we would be charged uh, a sum. So the, the the catch here is on the ATM infrastructure in the country. Uh, banks are under a lot of pressure on maintaining uh, the ATMs and uh, coordinating the transactions there. So uh, I think uh, the government uh, appreciated that the existing bank uh, uh, network cannot support much of the ATM operations in this country, and we need non-bank operators also to step in. And in that direction, uh, non-bank entities were also permitted to open ATMs. And uh, in this direction again, uh, FDA has been permitted under the automatic route up to 100%, no approvals required. However, the catch is that the, the net worth of that entity investing in, uh, 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 in the, uh, the uh, net worth of the non-bank entity should be 100 crore or more. So a minimum capitalization, uh, capitalization norm is what has been established and uh, uh, if this non-bank entity also undertakes any of the NBFC kind activities which are prescribed by the RBI, such non-bank entity should also comply with the minimum capitalization norms under the NBFC rules. So if, it, if the, the non-bank entity does not undertake any NBFC activity, 100 crore is the capitalization norm. <coughs> But if it undertakes any NBFC activity, 18 listed NBFC, because there are 18 uh, activities which class, uh, qualify as uh, NBFC activities, then if this uh, entity engages in any of those 18 activities, it also has to comply, it, it will be treated as an NBFC, and the RBI norms on NBFCs will equally be applicable to this entity. So this is uh, in, uh, this is towards enhancing the financial inclusiveness agenda of the government. Uh, the other amendments uh, happened, uh, a few key amendments which happened uh, through our mass circulars which came out in, on July 1st, 2015. So one of uh, 
Yeah, uh, in our master pillar for uh, establishing and closure of license offices and branches, branch offices, there was this requirement earlier that if we have to close down the LO or BO and remit, repatriate the money back to the home country, one of the one of the approaches which was required was a no objection certificate or tax clearance certificate from the income tax department. And uh, getting this no objection tax uh, clearance certificate from the department was a pain, especially when the scrutiny for liaison offices became strict. Uh, a routine a uh, simpliciter liaison office was also uh, subject to like, uh, like an assessment proceeding. The kind of questions they asked, the kind of documents uh, which were required to be filed was extremely rigorous. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, I guess uh, some representations went to the government that uh, uh, I can establish a liaison office uh, very quickly in India, but if I have to go out if I have to shut the liaison office, I need to really work hard at uh, getting the uh, NOC. Actually, in, uh, we personally had uh, uh, we personally had some experience in getting an NOC, and I think it took us about roughly about 20 to 25 visits to the tax office to get the NOC finally. So uh, that requirement, thankfully, has now been removed. So there are a set of simple regulations now with which we can close up a license office or a branch office. This again, this again comes back to uh, this uh, this point which makes the headlines ease of doing business in India. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, India ranks badly when it comes to ease of doing business. Uh, setting up a company, closing up a company, closing, uh, winding down a company, etc. takes a lot of time and India has got a lot of bad publicity on, on that. I think uh, that is what has been implicitly factored by when they are doing this and that is also in line with the uh, incorporation norms which have been simplified, consolidated and rationalized under the new companies act. So all these, I mean, all these developments, I think uh, we need to look at it holistically and bucket it in this uh, 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 in this uh, category that India is looking, the government is keen on having the having India be a good place for doing business and all of these amendments, all of these policy pronouncements, all of these legal requirements are towards that, that direction. Another uh, uh, minor amendment uh, which happened through the mass circulars uh, was uh, through the LRS scheme. So uh, under the LRS scheme earlier, uh, there was uh, there was this requirement that uh, uh, you could approach a bank to uh, you cannot approach a bank to uh, to make a which uh, you cannot approach a bank to avail funds which would then be used for a remittance under the liberalized remittance scheme. So if I avail of a loan from a bank to say support my parents uh, support a medical treatment outside India, which is permitted under LRS, that was not permitted at all. Even current account transactions were prohibited to be subsidized by a bank loan. Now the government has liberalized this and now the RBI has liberalized this and mentioned that you can borrow to make a current account payment outside India under the LRS, but you cannot borrow to make a uh, to uh, undertake a capital account transaction outside India. That is a uh, minor amendment, but uh, it will have significant repercussions for individuals who who have relatives outside India who have children studying outside India, uh, uh, who travel frequently outside India. Excuse me, what is the limit uh, under LRS? LRS is uh, $250,000. Oh, okay. So we can borrow? You can borrow say $250,000 from, from an Indian bank and use it for a capital account transaction? No. Current account. Uh, sorry, sorry, current account transaction outside India. So I uh, just to give an example with the next. Fund, for example, something in the US. So we can borrow from there. No, no, this is from domestic bank. So, what purpose are you remitting it outside India? Suppose uh, we are doing some business in US, we need some money. That's, that's a capital account transaction, that's an investment outside India. So, that will not be permitted. Exactly. So, current account will consist of what are the things that you go to the bank and you can borrow from there. Uh, yeah. Purchase of goods, services, payment for services, purchase of goods. So, is there any proof we need to show that is, we are remitting money for that reason? And the control check is, uh, happens at the AD level itself. When we approach the banker and we tell him this is the purpose, he will apply his discretion at that moment and he will communicate. Uh, okay. So, what is the 
NRPC. See, the LRS is you make an application through the LRS form. So where you will declare what is the purpose for which it is being remitted. And then, you know, because they need also need to monitor the annual limit. Are you within the $250,000? Okay. So that's how it will be tracked. Uh, connected to this is uh, another amendment uh, which is uh, on, on uh, remittances for students who are studying outside India. Okay. So uh, under the LRS, uh, remittances to students studying outside India could be made up to $100,000. Uh, 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 but now with the amendment, this limit has been increased to full limit of the LRS, that is $250,000. So, uh, for uh, uh, if, if a payment is made to a student studying abroad for his education purposes, the evidence can be made up to $250,000. However, assume his tuition fees are much more than $250,000, then it can go beyond that as well, and that is also permitted. That is what is meant by this could be further enhanced as demanded by the university abroad. So, to promote education of in, uh, Indian origin, Indian students in uh, uh, Indian students outside India, this amendment has uh, been made. Again, uh, uh, towards enhancing the limit, uh, it is also permitted to remit up to one billion dollars per financial year out of state proceeds of assets or balances in the NRO accounts in India. So, to help students studying outside India, the government has gone whole hog in bringing down all the issues. Excuse me, so NRO, so whatever in NRO we are having in India, up to 1 million we can send it back? Send it to that student. To two students. Okay, but it should be in NRO. Ha, correct. And, and, and uh, so in NRE also it can be or NRO? No, only NRO. 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 Only NRO. Only NRO. NRO. See, NRO even today, as the things stand, up to 1 million is repatriable from out of your NRO account. Now, the point here is that in order to encourage or to facilitate uh, studies abroad, the entire 1 million can be used from the NRO account for the purpose of uh, funding the education of children abroad. Not only that, even the proceeds out of sale of assets could be adjusted. So which means you can even go beyond the 1 million. You had 1 million in the NRO account plus Sale proceeds of your assets could be utilized for the purpose of funding the uh, education of students abroad. So that is uh, uh, the government going whole hog on uh, students for students studying abroad. Uh, the next key amendment uh, was uh, uh, to factor the uh, law laid down by the Black Money Act. So the Black Money Act required us to declare all our so-called black money within us a particular period in which uh, you will be penalized. So the other tricky point was why we addressed this issue from an income tax standpoint. We hadn't addressed the FEMA angle to it. So again we had an asset outside India which itself was a uh, uh, was a, again a capital account transaction. A capital account transaction which supposedly required a prior approval wasn't was undertaken without any prior approval. So once I declared that asset in India as, as part of a person to this Black Money Act the question became, didn't I violate FEMA? So with FEMA now, I, because of the Black Money Act, I made a lot of disclosure of assets to uh, comply with the Black Money Act. But please don't catch hold of me under the FEMA law as well. So towards that uh, uh, direction, the FEMA, uh, uh, FEMA itself uh, 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 has been amended and in the say, to say that there will be no penal proceedings can be initiated against the, the declare, uh, declarer if he declares the uh, such assets. Uh, so no proceedings to lie under FEMA against a declarant for an asset held abroad for which tax and penalties under the Black Money Act has been paid. Again, uh, he's declared this asset now. Now he wants to sell that asset. Uh, ideally, he would have required uh, an approval of the RBI or whichever government authority if he, under, under FEMA if he had to dispose uh, of such asset. So these regulations seem to say that no, no permission is required to dispose of the asset so declared and to bring back the proceeds to India within 180 days from liquidation. So they have done away with the permission as well. However, if I still want to retain that asset, I do not want to dispose of the asset, then a post facto approval is permitted. And this is what uh, the, the regulation also provides. A permission can be sought from the RBI if the declarant wishes to hold the asset. So there again, uh, the, uh, uh, an approval has to be obtained and uh, the 
different can continue to hold us. So these uh, these amendments are uh, so as to facilitate and uh, uh, synchronize the uh, regulations of the Black Money Act so that they don't fall fall of the FEMAL. Employee stock options, as long as they are uh, they are subject to uh, Indian law, right? So if the company has been no, no, no. Yeah, it covers for all assets. It covers all assets, whether it is in the form of uh, immovable property or anything. Even shares which you had held outside India, uh, not declared it, and now you have declared it and brought it. As long as you paid the penalty under the uh, Money Act, then you are committed to. Uh, you are immune. I mean, basically, immunity is granted for any penal provisions to kick in as well as FEMA is concerned. Now, when it comes to sale, selling, you continue, you sell, sell the uh, share and you are allowed to repatriate the money into India. You continue to hold it over there, then you need to uh, actually intimate the RBI because then they can go through the monetary process as to whenever you are going to uh, sell it, we have to ensure that you get back the money. The sort of listing uh, of the state of listing it is taxable in India. So listing paid tax in India and both uh, stocks without selling there. No, once uh, uh, you paid tax in India, that means you made a declaration about its existence. These are all cases where you have not declared that you own those shares. And now, under the Black Money Act, you are making a declaration that this was omitted to be informed by you to the tax authorities and therefore you are informed. So it doesn't cover the case that you are talking about, where you have paid taxes, that means you have declared. No, as far as income tax, we have to declare all the assets and Correct. Yeah, you are supposed to declare. Uh, I didn't get the last part of your... Uh, My point is that uh, when I sell 15, 180 days, the money has to come back, even if I pay my tax. That is the right of the only people are assets which are not declared earlier and declared under black money. Still, I can hold the money there. If you want to hold it, then earlier there is no permission. Now you have to take from market. holding it outside India. Holding Again, that should qualify as an undisclosed asset. So if you disclose it in our returns, it is no longer an undisclosed asset. Uh, so those are the uh, amendments to uh, uh, sink in with the Black Money Act. Uh, and then uh, there are again uh, these investments as uh, Pankasa was mentioning. Uh, amendments uh, to usher in investment in the infrastructure sector. We have the real estate investment trust, the infrastructure investment trust and the alternative investment trust. So earlier uh, 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 there were investments under these, uh, through these uh, uh, such entities wasn't permitted. Now FDI, FPI that is called portfolio investment and NRI investment is permitted in uh, REITs, INVITS and AIFs. Uh, so, uh, that's under the automatic route and the RBI has laid down specific guidelines which are particular to such entities and uh, they are uh, primarily uh, facilitative of investments in REITs etc. So, persons who acquire units in REITs can sell it in a manner specified by SEBI or RBI. Basically, these entities are governed basically to establish these entities in India. You require the approval of either the SEBI or the or the RBI. So uh, when the when these uh, invest when these entities are established itself, there will be a whole uh, uh, there will be formative conditions. For example, you can issue the units only to these persons, etc. And these persons can hold it for uh, hold it in this manner, etc. So uh, persons can acquire the units subject to those conditions. Again, uh, downstream investments by these investment vehicles. See, for example, the real estate investment trusts invest in, uh, say, a real estate development company. Uh, that will be that downstream investment would, by the investment vehicle, would be regarded as a foreign investment if neither the sponsor, manager, or investment manager is Indian owned or controlled. So again, now it comes back to uh, to identify whether that 
that uh, uh, RAT, uh, RAT is, uh, is Indian owned or foreign owned. You, you go back and check the status of the sponsor manager of the, or the investment manager of such entity. If such sponsor is not Indian or owned or controlled, <laughs> then this becomes a, uh, the, the investment becomes a foreign investment. Again, LLPs are restricted to act as sponsors. So uh, it's only companies and individuals who can act as uh, sponsors managers. Then uh, such downstream investments should again comply with the FDA policy. Uh, for example, AAS. AAFs can invest in a whole host of sectors, not restricted to real estate. So, if they are going to invest in a uh, uh, in a sector in which uh, uh, there is a government approval required, they cannot do so because downstream investment is not uh, fully permitted for a entity operating in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the in a sector which requires a uh, government approval. Again, foreign investors are permitted to place the units as security for credit facilities. These are again operational uh, uh, operational guidelines to facilitate the investment in RAITs. Foreign investments again in the invest investing vehicle subject to reporting requirements as required from time to time. So basically, the, uh, there is now a regime, full-fledged regime to permit investment set up, set up, setting up uh, REITs in which an AF is already there. But, uh, Inviting foreign uh, investment into these uh, uh, entities was something which was not there and now with these regulations the government has put in place that regime also. So uh, we, are, we are also not far behind in looking at uh, uh, alternative investment options to fund say companies as well as infrastructure undertakings. So again uh, all of these all of these amendments that we see from, from the ADI policy liberalization to the ECB policy as well as the amendments to the mass circulars, etc. They see, they make, the, the primary agenda is to promote business in India, to ease uh, uh, foreign exchange transactions, etc. And uh, that, that was one of the main uh, uh, plans of the government when it, when it uh, came in uh, uh, last year. And all of these policy pronouncements are in line with that uh, agenda of the government. Uh, so, uh, yeah, with that, uh, uh, I just uh, want to wind up uh, the session. So, uh, if there are any specific questions, uh, we could uh, just uh, take it. Can you just uh, throw some light on the gifts? Uh, you know, and how to find it. Gifts to be made and to be received from relatives or from home. Receive no restrictions, sir. You can go ahead and receive whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, as it comes to making, that is restricted under, it is treated as a part of the current account transactions and now the limit is 10,000 uh, US dollars or equivalent per financial, per uh, calendar year or financial year, calendar year I think. That is the restriction of uh, Sir, yeah. this is about the pricing guidelines. Yeah. Uh, if a foreign company yeah. invests 100, made 100% subsidy in Indian company. Okay. Okay, and this Indian company wants to buy shares of an Indian company from a resident. Is the pricing guidelines applied as a transfer from resident to another state? Now, you are, okay, now you need to test the uh, control. Okay. Okay, now is the 100 percent subsidiary which is in India, yes. okay, or the foreign holding company, then first step down is the 100 percent subsidiary here in India. Uh, is this controlled or owned by a foreign entity. Yes. It is 100 percent owned by a foreign entity. Yes, yes. So it by implication becomes a foreign entity as far as per the step down investment has to be made. Okay. So you are going to be making an investment or you are going to buy out shares from the existing shareholder. Exactly. They are resident. Yes. You are a non-resident or a foreign entity as far as FEMA goes. Okay. Will uh, pricing uh, well and supply? So, but uh, section 2 uh, B of FEMA, uh, sir, is an Indian enterprise. Yeah. Indian enterprise, means a company incorporated in India. Yes. Uh, so, and, and it says it's a person. <coughs> definitely. No, uh, definitely. I mean, see, if you interpret the person who is a resident in India, you qualify as a person resident yes. in India, no doubt about it. Yes. But that is to uh, only facilitate the understanding of your status here in India. I mean, there are more specific guidelines which are, as I told you, you will have to view FEMA from a perspective that some of these 
notifications and rules that come out are very loosely worded. But then, to give intent on the uh, rational way, see otherwise you can get away very uh, scot free by promoting an Indian entity and then saying that I am a resident Indian and then continue to do everything under the garb of an Indian entity, which is not permitted also to a foreign entity. So it will defeat the very purpose of the legislation. So you have to interpret it more harmoniously and say yes, for the limited purpose here, you will be treated as a person resident outside India and you are transacting of sale of shares with a resident in India, therefore pricing guidelines will apply. Thank you. Uh, in the same instance where yes, the sir. foreign entity hmm. having an NRA as one of the shareholder, a foreign entity having an NRA as a shareholder, okay, and uh, an Indian company which is owned by the NRA, hundred yes. percent, okay, will this uh, new guidelines will help the takeover in any manner? Is there a liberalisation? Uh, in my view, yes. Because NRI investments in India are deemed to be as a domestic company. Okay. So if you say that the NRI who owns the foreign entity, yeah. let's say he owns 100% uh, of it. No, he doesn't own 100%. Let us say he owns only a minority stake. Then it would be difficult for you to contend and treat it as a domestic investment. Okay. But so long as it is coming under any of the sectors which are either uh, you know, software. automatic software, hundred percent is under automatic. Correct. So to that extent, you can take the benefit and say that it will be fully automated. No, but what is the liberalization design is providing for in this context? Sir, what more liberalization did you want? Even in the software sector, earlier hundred percent was permitted without under the automatic. What more do you want, sir? Yeah, but there is no extra that is being available now. No, wherever the, I mean, already it was fully liberalized. What else do you want? Okay. You want tax exemptions? <laughs> That's not within the purview. Of course, tax exemption you can't ask for. Yeah, so what more do you want? So pricing guidelines will apply, even in this case? Yes, yes. Sir, with respect to the LRS, you mean? Yeah. It's a 250,000 dollars. The credit card expenses are also part of it, or in recent the amendment has included everything under the LRS, you mean? So, is it that international credit card, even domestic card, purchase any local purchase, when they travel abroad and they use that credit card, is that part of it or is it exempted? No, as far as your ICC usage is concerned, it does not come for the purpose of treating it as part of the LRS permitted wherever you are making an investment or making a remittance outside India. It is treated as part of your other uh, current account transaction for travel abroad, for medical expenses abroad, there are limits. If that is used within those purposes, then it is counted there for those uh, limits. But LRS, I would say, is independent of this. So, beyond this ICC usage for regular current account uh, uh, transactions which are listed in Schedule 2, other than that, if you have done, then that will go as part of your analysis. If it, uh, you have done it for any of those other purposes, then it will be in addition to whatever you have spent. So, $250,000 plus permitted under Schedule 2. I think even the foreign travel and uh, uh, expenses, yeah, I think it is included part of the analysis. Yes, if, no, not necessarily so, sir. What I am trying to say is, you can take it as, supposing you had purchased uh, foreign currency. Okay, or traveler checks, and you would have met that uh, expenditure. Okay, now you could, so you have done that, plus you could have done a remittance of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars under the LRS scheme. So LRS doesn't subsume everything under this. It's in addition to that. So if it is in the nature of a firm, let's say you are going for a uh, business visit, and you are incurring uh, a travel expense. Does it mean that you know your LRS limit will be reduced from 250000 dollars to whatever you have spent for uh, business travel visit? No. So travel visit will be as permitted under the current account transaction the limits. So it is in addition to that. Okay. But the recent amendment, amendment was something like everything is included part of the. No, 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 no not, not to disturb the uh, schedule of what was permitted. 
because uh, it's very unique specific filing requirement if an NRI is investing in India. If an NRI is investing in India. Yes, now since it will be treated as a domestic company, is yeah. there any filing requirement? This, or yeah, this was dealt with uh, uh, during my presentation. He had told you that filing of FCGPRS, FCGPR or FCTRS would not be required in case of an NRI investment into an Indian company. Sir, one more question. There was a specific exemption in the master circular of RBI that a uh, uh, company in manufacturing industry can borrow money for its operational expenses from foreign direct investors. So that exemption is still uh, valid? Yeah, it does continue. Excepting, see, uh, as you rightly said, in the services sector there was a, a restriction. That continues. For manufacturing companies, for operational expenses, that is your working capital expenses, yes, yes. then wholesale liberalization which has been brought about, that continues. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah, this is question. Enoric becomes a uh, no, resident during 1516. Okay. So, what happens to the assets at outside India? Is it enough to declare that assets during the 1516 filing See, if. Uh, the black money. Okay. Black money is applicable. Uh, okay, I, okay, I am not uh, fully uh, qualified to answer that question because uh, IT is not my forte. But uh, was he a, a resident for the purpose of the Income Tax Act? Was this was he required? I mean, see, if you are saying he was an NRI. No, NRI. 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 NRI is filing the returns in India in the capacity of non resident So he, he continues to uh, hold the either the resident status or no, resident no. but not ordinarily resident status in India. Therefore, his global income is taxed in India and he is filing his income tax return in India, but he did not declare the I think it is a clear case of violation under the Black Money Act and he will have to declare it once he comes to whether he comes to India or not. Even while he is in an array, he should have declared it within the due date. I mean, uh, anybody else on including Bharat, if you have a different Okay. That's the Black Money Act that we no, but if it was taxable in India, I did not declare it. No, he may have. See, if he is a globally taxed, then fine. If he is a resident but not a resident. Okay. And in case he will earn something abroad, he will purchase a property there. Okay. The whole question is, was he required to declare that asset here in India? No. no. If he was not required to declare it, then he need not declare it. Right. Once he becomes resident here, yeah, then, then he, he has to declare. Yes, then it is. See, then you know whether it uh, the Black Money Act or not, he will not be caught under the Black Money Act because he was not required to declare it at that point in time. Yes. Now, in the ordinary course of things, he declares it because he become a resident and he becomes taxable for his global income and uh, global assets. So he declares it now. Then he won't be penalized uh, under the Black Money Act. This is a case for most of Indian expatriates yeah. where they are working abroad. Yeah. See, you need to see from the uh, fact what is his residential status under the Income Tax Act. Because they are two different things. Under FEMA, a resident is different, uh, uh, and under the Income Tax Act, a resident is different. So, you need to see it from the Income Tax Act whether he was a resident at that time when he did not declare. Was he required to declare it at that point in time? And there are some cases where they were required to declare. The file uh, uh, returns here, they did not file, and there is a time bar. They could not file the return. No, that's why you could still make it. You did not declare your other thing, you could still make it another uh, Black Money Act and have, could have declared it now. Yeah, that is all my question. So, is it the Black Money? He has not declared, but the money has it paid. It should have been declared at the end of the day. It cannot be Black Money because it is earned abroad. But the more question again is, should it have been declared in India? If it should have been declared in India... There is no character of income in India, there is no... Difference. No, then, then that, that, that is what will answer the question, should it have been declared in India? Would it 